Uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson is uh, joining us via Skype. There's an event coming up, Neil deGrasse Tyson. Cosmic Collisions, it's at the uh, Long Beach Terrace Theater. That is uh, Monday, tonight as you hear this, Monday, March 25th. And dates coming up all over San Jose and Sacramento as well. I'll tell you more about that in a second. Uh, Neil, thanks for joining us. Hey, thanks for having me on. I, I, I feel like a old friend. I've been on a couple of times, and it's always good to just be in your just to just to hang with you. To, to use his terms, it's to be in your orbit, Adam. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, elliptical orbit. As long as, long as it's a non-collisional orbit, we're fine. <laughs> you have a book that I'm intrigued by here called "Accessory to War: The Unspoken Alliance Between Astrophysics and the Military." Can you shed a little light on that? Yeah, it's a pretty fat book. I, in fact, I have a co-author, um, Avis Lang, because I, I, I calculated it would take me about a thousand years to have finished writing that book. Wow. So I have a longtime uh, collaborator and researcher, Avis Lang. And it's an exploration of the centuries and millennia that astronomers and astrophysicists, just we folk who only care about the universe, actually made fundamental contributions to military hegemony. And normally you think of us as pretty passive, which we are. You know, we wait for the photons of light to reach us, gather them in a detector and take them home and contemplate the universe. But it turns out we have a lot of resonant interests with military interest. We care about precision uh, 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 timing. We care about multispectral imaging. We care about the movement of fast moving objects in the sky and the mathematics, the physics, the engineering that we do and that the military does. When you part the curtains, there's a resonance between the two that has not really previously been explored and it's done at, to great lengths in this book. Yeah, well, look no further than the uh, fat boy, fat little boy and fat man. I'm trying yeah. to think of the atomic bombs, but... Uh, yeah, yeah, the two atomic bombs. The, the yeah, Manhattan you, you experiment. Right. I mean, it's crazy. Also, it's crazy. I just saw some World War II in color kind of thing. Yeah. yeah. It is insane. In the mid-1940s, everything was mechanical, and they're doing all these calculations with slide rulers yeah. and steno pads oh, and stuff, yeah. and everything is huge. Yeah. Everything right, is right. massive. But the idea that everything, well, not everything, but that it worked is yeah. an insane undertaking. Yeah, if you put enough smart people in a room, uh, uh, scientists with clever and talented engineers, they can make almost anything happen. And I'll give you one other fast example relevant to the nuclear era. Um, astrophysicists were hired by Los Alamos. Uh, the, by the way, Los Alamos is the keeper of the nation's nuclear arsenal. And they've been that ever since they were conceived. Well, why would they hire us? Well, we care about how stars make energy. This is thermonuclear fusion in the center of a star tamped down by the gravitational weight of the star itself. Well, on the other side of the wall where the astrophysicists are doing their calculation, sharing the same computer, are people calculating the yields on nuclear fusion weapons that, of course, replaced the simple tiny atomic bombs that leveled Hiroshima and Nagasaki. The, the hydrogen bomb, it is the way stars make energy, and it's the way – it, and it, it is the foundation of the Cold War arsenal that kept this the world hostage for 50 years. You mentioned that uh, smart people can make anything happen. We were Adam and I were having a conversation about global warming to that very end, trying to figure out what we could do, what are we likely to do to solve that problem, and how is that going to work? What, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I, you know, let me give it a, a fun sort of admittedly naive but hopeful thought that we figure out how to just scrub the CO2 from the atmosphere, use right. solar panels, get the energy, and then we could actually tune the future climate of the planet right. to our liking. Right. By the way, we already know how to redirect rivers. We create dams. We uh, Los Angeles has this huge LA river basin to prevent floods. You know, uh, uh, engineers have been messing with Earth's natural way ever since we've had engineers. So the next level would be geoengineering on a, uh, on a scale where uh, maybe, you know, okay, too much CO2, take some out. Yep. All right, make that adjustment. Make yep. the measurement. Okay, we're good for another 10 years. I, I, I don't, you know, I, that's how I see it. Solutions hardly ever come from people changing their behavior. They come from a clever person 
coming up with a solution to the problem, and then we move on to the next. This is what we were uh, saying, right? Well, we're yeah. talking about nuclear, and I've spoken to a few scientists and a few people who seem to know um, this world, and they say that nuclear is good, but it's got a lot of negative stigma attached to it, and thus it's not going to fly it, from a, more of a popularity standpoint than a effectiveness standpoint. That's completely accurate. That is completely accurate. It's safer than people's sentiment would have you think it is. By, right? by set or several orders of magnitude, right? Yes, yes. Yeah. In fact, yes. And so it's the you know it's one of the two um, two banned N words in our society. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, what would I, here's here's what here's my thing, and and I yeah. realize it's political. But my argument is it doesn't have to be political. I was literally saying to my wife the other day, she's like, you know, when you get all bossy and it sounds like you're judging and blah, blah, blah. And it's like, sometimes I'm just saying rinse the coffee mug and it just means rinse the coffee mug. It's not a put down. You know, yeah. you're taking it as you're politicizing. How you say it, Adam? Rinse the coffee mug. Yeah. I'm literally want a coffee mug that doesn't have a ring around it in two days. So I'm saying it. Why must it be politicized? And I would say the same thing about nuclear. Like, what if some sort of uh, right thinking person said, look, uh, I, I want to get rid of the coal fire generators and I don't want to dam up any more rivers because uh, the, the trout are trying to hatch. But uh, nuclear, I know someone said no nukes in 1974 and we all got a bad taste in our mouth, but the technology's come a long way. We're all we're all going the same direction. We want clean fuel. Uh, sure, wind, solar, that's on the horizon, but we're not there yet. How about it? Yeah, so interesting. The uh, University of Oxford has a new professorship, new in the last decade or so, a professorship of the public understanding of risk. Right. That's uh, the name of a professorship. And when you look at how much, how tolerant we have been of the health and life disasters that mining coal has brought upon civilization in the last 150 years, you know, tens of thousands of deaths, hundreds of thousands of deaths in the process of uh, 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 digging for coal, mining coal, the lung deaths, that pe- the breathing deaths that have come about from it. We somehow accept that. And you get intermittent um, uh, nuclear uh, accidents with a death toll far less than that. And then people react and want to ban all nuclear. The point is, if we understood risk more rationally, oh. we'd be making very different decisions in our lives. Well, well this, I, this I is agree. a general problem. Humans I, have a horrible assessment. They don't, we don't, no one has an ability to assess probability. I, I agree. Like I talk to people all the time. What about nuclear? Like, what about Fukushima? And I was like, a, a tsunami hit and nobody died or yeah. two people died. I don't know. Yeah. What do you think? Everything is just all the, all the pipelines, all the underground drilling, all the shale, all the, you think it's all just nobody's ever injured no one no one in an offshore oil derrick has ever been injured like but whole movies have been about that right oh my god the right. armageddon the best movie ever made <laughs> had all the whole first <laughs> i know you didn't just say best movie ever made right, i know you top, didn't just say that. top five but either way <laughs> they, bruce willis was he was a leatherneck out there it was great yeah all right so i'm I'm so see Neil. I'm glad to hear you say this because I think Drew and I felt the same way, which is, look, we would like to solve this CO2 problem ourselves. Yeah. Thus, yeah. Let's go do nuclear's it. on the on the table. Let's not freak out. Let's go solve the problem. By the way, a quick one. I think you'd appreciate. Do you ever hear about the the risk of the manure catastrophe? Do you ever read about that? No. So it, it, in in Manhattan, in New York City, a hundred and some you know ten years ago, hundred and ten years ago or so, uh, the city was getting busier and busier, and there were all these sort of horse drawn delivery carts and horse drawn taxis, cabs they were called, and and so horses would poop right, and the poop would be all over the street, street, and so someone would come clean it up. There's only so much of that you could sell as fertilizer when you live in the middle of a major metropolitan area. So they started hauling it over to a side street and then slowly would take it out of town. By the way, this would breed flies and it was nasty. And so they did the calculation. They said, if this keeps up, we will reach a manure catastrophe (laughs) where the horses that bring in the carts to remove the manure 
leave as much manure behind them as they take out. Yeah. Right. And so you reach a catastrophic tipping point. And so how do you do? Do you give horses food that makes them poop less? Do you not feed them hay? And this, what solved the problem was the car. Right. Period. The and, car. And we switched from horses, which we've been using for thousands of years, to cars in about 10 years. I think we better just sit around and wring our hands and maybe get uh, the vice president in there to talk about how this is the end, this is it, everyone just prepare. <laughs> well, what, what I'm, what the part that is um, the discouraging to this podcaster is <laughs> I get that there's folks like my mom who say no nukes, but the politicians – are elected to make the kind of decisions, not win a popularity contest, but to do what is best for the constituency. And it drives me insane that they want no part of this. Um, Neil. Yeah, but wait, 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 wait. In all fairness, it's always been a popularity contest. Uh, I'm sure. Right, right. We want to not believe that. Yeah. But it's odd that, you know, when you hire a CEO or anybody important in a company, there's a resume that gets debated, it gets talked about. Whereas the, 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 Put someone in power to run an entire country and to be the head of the free world, it's a popularity contest. Yep. It's been that way from the beginning. Yep. So we know that. Yeah. So if you had a magic wand, Neil deGrasse Tyson, uh, just in summation here, and uh, Green New Deal and uh, global warming and all that, what would, what would you put into place? You have a magic wand. You have an unlimited expense account. You can do anything you want. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay. So that's that's a great question. Well, uh, I would I, I, get, I have a cop out answer to that. What I would do is I would try to make sure that elected officials, if they are not otherwise scientifically literate, because it is a popularity contest, that they are somehow trained to know how to listen to experts. Oh boy. And <laughs> rather than friends or wish something to be true that is objectively false, then. The leaders, the forces of leadership would have some hope of bringing the nation, our society, civilization forward with an expectation that we will survive ourselves. And and I think you, you need to put in that kind of recipe into how things are so that you don't have to worry about it a generation from now or a generation after that, because the seeds of our survival will then be um, uh, planted from the beginning and just unlimited money. Okay, fine. Here's what I do. I'll up the science budget because it is from science where we get the solutions, not only to problems that science causes, of course, but also to problems that we don't foresee coming based on our behavior, our desires, based on what direction things happen to go. And and so no one's going to give up their smartphone. No one's going to give up their, their uh, transportation options. They're things you don't want to give up and they're all brought to you by science and technology. Let's face that. And so let's have more of that in society. So the next time the hurricane comes, you don't say, buy toilet paper, buy what, run. Instead of that, you have engineers in your mists and you say, how can I tap the cyclonic energy of that hurricane, use it to drive the energy needs of the city so that the city thrives instead of getting leveled by the hurricane. That's an example of the kind of thinking you want to be pervasive in society. Without it, we might as well just all move back to the caves because that's where we're headed. Uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson, I'll be praying for your soul tonight, yes, my me friend. Too, me too. <laughs> it's going to be at the Long Beach Terrace Theater that is uh, coming up that Monday, March twenty uh, fifth, and there's dates Let's all talk about collisions, everything that collides, colliding galaxies, asteroid collisions, and I will give a shout out to Armageddon. I must. Um, Great film. And, and, and I'll, I'll say it's one of your it's one of your favorite movies. I'll <laughs> tell the audience. And we had a uh, we had a near collision up in the uh, near Alaska a week or so ago, right? Yeah, so I mean, the the point is, this has been going on all the time. We just know about it now. <laughs> right, right. There are better ways of detecting, Excellent. which is pretty scary. Uh, the Hayden Planetarium dot org slash Tyson is uh, where tickets are available. Always great to talk to you, my friend. I hope to see you in person real soon. Yeah, one day, definitely. Thanks for having me on. Thanks, Neil deGrasse Tyson.